So, my dear friends, welcome at this uh, 37th Christian Artist Seminar. <laughs> That's an awful long time. The organization is a little bit older, that is 39 years. That means that next year we will have a beautiful celebration, but that's next year. Still we have to do this year. Uh, I sit because I uh, came from the hospital this morning. And I cannot stand long times and I can a lot of things not. Uh, because I had uh, very unexpected an operation this uh, Thursday uh, early evening. My appendix had to be removed because it was uh, absolutely very bad. So um, normally it takes five days. That would mean I would have shown up at Wednesday at the closing ceremony and they'd say, hey, you're all here, that that's wonderful. But uh, I could sign up for a very experimental program. So I'm a medical experiment at the moment, you know. <laughs> so if I drop down, um, <laughs> it's an experiment. And uh, so you always can pray for me, that's uh, maybe helpful. So I don't know what it means being part of an, such a medical program, but at least it's experimental. And because I signed up a special form, I could be here today. Thank you. But um, standing up and doing... A <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> but standing up and doing the opening lecture is... Uh, uh, that, that is too much for me. So... Uh, our dear friend Jill will read my opening text that will explain why we are here, why we have this team this year. And it is uh, basically what we are trying to do this year is a two-side track. Um, for the arts is no future unless we participate in innovation. Yeah? That's one track. And that speaks about yourself and um, what your skills are. The other one is... Innovation is not possible unless we have spiritual renewal. That's the other side of the same coin. Um, so normally at church conferences there is a lot of, about spiritual renewal and all of that stuff. Uh, but then they forget to explain to you what the practical side is. So we have here both. You know? And I believe that God's Spirit is here to help us through these days to help us understand why we need a renewal of our mindset and the renewal of our skills. That's what I believe is the future for the arts and for the artists in Europe. That's, I believe, the foundation on which we stand. And I believe God will bless that. So now I stop, otherwise I start a new lecture. And that's the timing for me. So... I will sit down and will listen to Lena Rivière. Applause for Jill. Yeah. Well, thank you, Lane. And uh, it's a real honor and a real pleasure to be able to deliver this opening lecture on behalf of Lane. And so welcome again, everybody. It's going to be a great week. We are gonna have a great time and it will be great thanks to all of you, in particular artists, teachers and staff who incidentally don't get paid, but they're all here because they believe in the concept of Christian artist to invest in the future in the arts, in each other, and in you, those of you who have come particularly as participants. And we're also very thankful for the financial support of the EZA and the EU, because without this money and without the investment, the content of the CA seminars would not be possible. We're also really thankful for the great cooperation of this SBI Centre, Last year, for some of you, um, we were in Germany at the KSI, and the renovation of that new centre became so expensive that they put the prices up by 100%. So in order to keep Christian artists going, um, we were really delighted that SBI here were able to relocate us back. And some of us feel like it's a homecoming. Who has been here before? Yeah, 
Yeah, it's a homecoming, isn't it? It's great to be back here in Holland at SBI. So thank you to the staff of SBI who have been so helpful. So why is Christian Artist Seminar so important? Well, there's a reality um, of total change in the sector of arts and culture. And here at Christian Artists, you will get important information. You'll get updates about so much that will help you find your way into the future. How to get an income, how you can work, how you can learn about the changes in the profession. And there are spiritual reasons. You have creative gifts that you want to nurture and so that your art and you as a person can be a blessing a blessing to yourself, but more importantly, a blessing for your community and a blessing for a wider context, which is Europe. And this is a practical aspect as well. It's the outworking of the kingdom of God. All over Europe, the climate has changed so much into an anti-artist's attitude. For instance, are artists just profiteers? Are they misusing money from the States? There are strange meanings about work delivered and created. Do we get value for money? And so the conclusion is that we should stand together and we need to move on together by learning with one another. And that helps explain the format of Christian artists. In this 2018 format, we have one and a half days of plenary sessions together to get up-to-date views about our sector, about work and income. And we get this input from several great speakers. If you do not agree with the content presented, you will also have your time to put your questions and remarks forward. And after each lecture, you will hear interviews with leading artists about how they've been able to survive, how they've been able to go on creating good work and have a meaningful life and continue to innovate. And after the day and a half of sessions together, we'll continue in workshops, which will help improve your skills. It's interesting that most artists and workers in the cultural sector are busy the whole year trying to survive. So busy that it's hard to think, it's hard to find time to pray, and to understand how a change in Europe is having an effect on their profession and activities. So these particular lectures will help you with that because they are about you and they are for you. And we hope they will help you to understand and receive advice. We hope that they will help you to raise those questions that are coming up for you and to find some answers to your personal questions. Some general changes that have had an effect are really part of European culture. And some of those changes are things like moving from ratio to motions, from I think it's right to I feel it's right, from objectivity to subjectivity, from modern to postmodern to meta uh, metamodernism, towards a disappearing of God, so what are real values worth living for? We also see a rise of populism, nationalism, and extremism across Europe. We have immigration and the fear of what immigration brings. We have the end of the financial and economic crisis, but still many are unemployed. And we have new political unrest in Brexit, Ukraine, Syria, IS. And of course, there's much more to be said about these changes. But it's important to think and to pray. What does it mean for you in your personal situation and context? What personal choices, what personal decisions do you have to make? And speaking on behalf of Lean, Lean says he has made that decision to follow Jesus Christ and to see that love is the example. Love is the answer, not hate. Having said that the financial and economic crisis is past does not mean that all is well and all is great in our particular arts and cultural sector. But what recent research tells us and re what reports are giving us are, interestingly, after graduation, 
uh, for students who have graduated and trying to make their art form and their profession work um, will lead to a disappointment for many. So that after five years of graduating, 50% will already have left the arts and culture sector scene. 10 years after graduation, only between four to 5% um, will be active as professional artists in the sector. The positive aspect of the figure is that these four to 5% have learned to do something right and they've learned to do something differently so that they have an income and that they can survive. So during the first one and a half days that we have, there are going to be a good number of life interviews with artists. And it'll be about how they've managed to survive and how they've managed to make it work. They've all passed the 10-year mark, and so there's a lot we can learn from them, a lot of experience that we can glean. Recently, a report came out in Germany, Deutsch Musikrat, and in the Netherlands, the Social Economic Council and National Council for Culture, also in Belgium and France, giving some shocking facts about the working conditions and income of artists and cultural workers, and this includes Christian artists. The annual yearly income in Western Europe is between 9,000 and 15,000 euros. It is not possible to live from that. So many are poor and struggling. A cynical politician from the Liberals said lately why the Liberals wanted to cut budgets for the arts and cultural sector. And he said, well, keep the artists poor so that they have the pressure to make better art, music and dance. Well, how do you actually do that with an empty stomach? Unfortunately, not much was heard about this foolish note about the arts world and hardly any protested. But more positively, and more to the point, you are here this week to fill your stomachs, to fill your minds and your hearts with good things, with hopefully good lectures, stimulating talks, meetings, concerts, and to receive, we hope, many blessings, to have wonderful food in this center. So we pray, we hope that this will be a very special week for you, a very special and inspiring time for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lane. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next uh, speaker is Evert van der Pol, old friend. He is as well a musician. And uh, last year he played the organ at the uh, German center we were in. So he will, give, he will give some thoughts about Europe. So that's the continent we live on. And I'm not so sure... Do you still have included England? Because uh, it's a little bit tricky. Huh? Okay, Evert, give the man a hand. What brings us here? There are three reasons. The first two you know all about that, and I, know, I don't know which of the two reasons should come first. The fact that you are Christian, or the fact that you are involved in or interested in artistic expressions, you decide which comes first. I would like to talk about the third reason. And the third reason might have gone unnoticed, but this is a seminar funded by the European Union. So, we are supposed to do something in the interest of Europe. At least that's in the mind of the organizers, of Lane, and of our fund givers, thanks to whom we can live here uh, despite our low budget life. But what does that mean? There are loads of conferences that take place in Europe, drawing people from all over the continent, but that really don't have anything to do with Europe. You could stage them somewhere else, and that would change nothing to the content. What does Europe mean? Why Europe? Why are we here? Because 
In the first place, this is our context. But that doesn't say a lot. We are here as Europeans and we are witnessing what is called the Europeanization of our countries. We are becoming more and more like each other. We eat each other's food, we travel in each other's countries, and we feel at home all over the continent that includes Britain. If the British want to go to the continent, they now have two options. They can cross the British Channel or the Irish Sea. In both cases, they will go to the continent. So they're caught in between. Um, and so there is a Europeanization. So we are becoming more and more Europeans and less and less Germans or Swiss or Norwegians. We are not only in Europe, we are Europe. This is a very strange paradox. Whenever people talk about Europe, they usually talk about something outside themselves. I'm going to Europe. We have something going on in Europe, meaning not in our country. Not only the British have this habit of placing the continent outside their country, all Europeans have the habit of talking about their country and Europe around us. So depending where you live, Europe can be Germany or the Netherlands, depending where you live. And so Europe changes all the time, and we should realize that we are Europe. We are Europe. Just a question. What is, in your mind, the most European city in Europe? What city would you qualify as a very European city? <laughs> Brussels? Yeah, some people are nodding, but not laughing. <laughs> other, other candidates? Leeuwarden? Leeuwarden? <laughs> I thought Leeuwarden. Now, Amsterdam. When you think about it, you are looking for qualities that make something European that is already in Europe. That means that Europe is not just a place, but it has a content. And based on that content, we qualify Brussels or Amsterdam or Leeuwarden or whatever you mentioned as very European. But as soon as you start talking about that, there is a huge cloud coming over us because nobody really has a definition of what is then so European about a city. In fact, every city in Europe is very European. But it is very European in a different way. And that is the trick about Europe. There is not one way to be European. We are all Europeans in a different way. We have been shaped in unity and in diversity. And in the past, it was Christianity that gave a coherent worldview to all these European tribes so that it became a, a cultural unity. But Christianity then had the genius of including elements of each local culture so that we have Christianity in many forms. And going to a Norwegian church is not like going to an Italian Pentecostal church or to go to a, a Portuguese Roman Catholic church. We have different shapes of Christianity, and so we have different shapes of being European. But we are all European in that matter. And Europe has always included elements of the cultures of the people that were embraced by Europe. Europe has never been static. It has always been developing. It has always been um, adding new elements. And so people who are claiming that they want to defend a European heritage or a Christian heritage are mistaken because Christianity has always been innovating, renewing itself and taking in the contribution of newcomers. That has been the key to the European civilization. It has never been a static civilization. Many civilizations have a glorious past to which they want to return. Christianity has a glorious future to which we want to go. And that worldview has modeled Europe. We are a future-minded civilization. We are always criticizing ourselves, trying to do things better, taking a better look at what we've done, and so we're developing. 
the word development, progress, it's typically European. So the word innovation is at the heart of what Europe is like. Europe has always been a place of innovation. And Christianity, the Christian faith, has been a major impulse to not lay back, to not accept the status quo, but to strive for something else. What does Europe mean? Here are six meanings. The most original meaning was, it is a direction. Aerope, it's a Greek word. In fact, it is a Semitic, it's an Hebrew or Aramaic word, Erev, which means evening or going down or sunset. That means the direction of Aerope, Erev, is westward. As opposed to Asu, which is the Hebrew Aramaic word for rising, of the rising of the sun, and that has given rise to the word Asia. Asia comes from rising. It is the land of the morning, opposing to the land of the evening, Abendland. Morgenland and Abendland. And so people said, we go to Europe, we go in that direction. Now, this is, this is not a very ancient thing only, but for today's world, it is a very vital thing for, for hundreds of thousands of people all over the world who want to go to Europe. And for them, it is a matter of life and death. And in the Mediterranean, people die in their efforts to go to Europe. It is still a major direction of many people in the world. And studies make out that we only have seen the beginning of it. People are not driven by an ideology. People are just driven by what they see on Google Maps, what is happening in Europe, and they want to go there, whatever the price. And you can't stop them. That is one thing. Europe is also a space. You can say you are in Europe. Most of us are in Europe. This is our space. This is the place where we live in. And so you can define Europeans by people who live in a certain area. But we should um, distinguish, as my question brought out, what is the most European city? Europe is also a whole. It is something that encompasses many parts. And in that sense, you are an element of that whole, that totality. That totality is more than a nation. It is more than a church. It is more than a neighborhood. It is more than a family. It is more than a tribe. It's more than a clan. It is more than a subculture. It is more than Christian artist seminar. It is a totality. And Europe is then a consciousness of belonging to that totality. It is a sense of belonging. We are part of Europe. You can speak of Europe as that as well. And then the fourth meaning, Europe stands for an ideal. In a sense, Europe doesn't exist yet. But we want it to exist. Ideally, we want all these Europeans who share common roots, who share common values, who have a common history, who have so much in common, who are so much like each other, to stop fighting each other and to come together in a peaceful world. If Europeans can't get on with each other, nobody can. Because nowhere in the world people have so much in common through such a long history as in Europe. Now, why can't we just come together and live in peace together? That Europe doesn't exist yet. It exists in the mind of philosophers like Immanuel Kant, who dreamt of eternal peace, starting in Europe, and then when it starts in Europe, it will spread to the whole world. In fact, we have had warfare in Europe starting here, spreading to the whole world. But Kant thought the reverse was possible as well, and his idea was that every nation should abolish monarchies, become a democracy, have a free market, open its border, and do commerce with each other. And so when people trade with each other, they go they, don't lo no, they no longer go at war with each other. Of course, that was a dream. Victor Hugo, the French author, he dreamt of this 
ideal Europe in which there was no longer a border between all these nations and groups in the, uh, on this continent. But that proved too difficult to realize. That brings us to the fifth meaning. Based on that ideal, attempts have been made to realize the ideal. Now, usually, that was done by an emperor or an empire who dreamt of becoming the leader of the whole of Europe. Napoleon was some, someone like that. Hitler dreamt of it. The communists dreamt of it. But no, none of these attempts was really successful because these attempts ended in warfare in nightmares. And then, suddenly, gradually, starting in Protestant Europe and then going to, to Catholic Europe, the idea of a concert of nations arose in the 16th century, the 17th century. The first attempts were made to, to create a sort of diplomatic structure between the countries in order to have a permanent contact and in order to prevent conflict. Now, one of the major problems was language. And of course, the French, they thought that everybody should speak French in order to negotiate and to have diplomacy. And they succeeded for a long time, but then after Napoleon made a mess of it, French was out, but there was no alternative. Now, today, there is an alternative. Everybody speaks English, but Britain doesn't want to be in anymore. So that's the paradox. <laughs> They have succeeded, and now they opt out. I think it's just, yeah, it's just one, just a bit too late. And so we had congresses, the Congress of Vienna, and it was called the Concert of the Nation, and to create a permanent structure to prevent warfare. And that's how the state of Belgium, for instance, are there Belgians in our? Are there Belgians here? No, no. Well, Belgium has been cre ah, welcome, has been created as a result of this Concert of Nations. After Napoleon, the Germans and the British and the French, they had a big ego, too big for Europe, and so they started fighting each other again. And then this structure of the Congress of Vienna brought the diplomats together and they, they just negotiated what to do with the uprising in Belgium. And so they, neg they negotiated a solution which everybody had to accept, including the Dutch king. And so Belgium was quite peacefully, it, well, you had a campaign, but compared to other wars, Belgium was created as a result of that. And then after the First World War, we had the Congress of Versailles, but it didn't really work out. And then after the Second World War, there was this magnificent idea of some Christian democratic uh, leaders to do two things together, to create a diplomatic structure between the governments, that was the Council of Europe, created by, on the impulse of uh, Winston Churchill, who was a very European leader, so that governments would have permanent contact and, need, and discuss with each other matters of common concern and to promote cultural exchange. That was the Council of Europe. That was an intergovernmental structure. And at the same time, create a transnational structure that took over some sovereignty of the national states in areas that were critical. And that was the community of coal and steel, which was um, launched on the initiative of uh, Robert Schumann and some others in France. And the idea there was that if you put the steel industry and the heavy industry under a transnational control, no country can produce arms anymore. And that was crucial for Europe, that to take away the sovereignty over the arms production. And that has been the, basically the structure of all the European institutions, partly transnational, partly intergovernmental. Now, you might be critical of that, but it's a unique solution that does not exist anywhere in the world. And we do not realize how much we have benefited from this dual solution, a political structure, the construction of Europe. And many people, when they talk about Europe, they refer to this structure that has been started after the Second World War and that has guaranteed us a, a lifetime of peace. And then the sixth meaning is Europe means something past or in decline. Um, I'm impressed by the number of books and articles that are appearing talking about post 
Europe or after Europe, saying that, well, all this business of European identity and culture, that's something of the past. We're now living in a globalized world, so what are we talking about? People are not more interested in Greece than they are in Japan. What's the difference? We're all becoming like each other. We're all eating McDonald's and having Google and what, whatever. We're in a global as well. So what's the interest? That's another way of talking about Europe as something that is past or in decline. And very often European Christianity is, is put under rubbish yard with that. <coughs> Let me just, few, uh, just show a few things when I come back to one of these points. The whole being part of Europe. Today we call that a family of cultures. In the past Europe was considered to be the Christian world and then it was considered to be a civilization. Today the European idea is that we have a, we have a, a family relationship. Our cultures share common roots like the roots of Greece, Athens, the roots of Rome, the Roman Empire, and Jerusalem, of course, the Bible, Christianity, and also the Jewish impact. Later on, we had the humanist movement, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution. But here is a very important point. When we talk about the roots in plural of Europe, we should notice that Christianity has not brought everything to Europe. We owe a lot to the Greeks. We owe a lot to the Jewish people, to Israel, to the ancient Testament, to the, to the Old Testament. We owe a lot to the Romans. But what Christianity did was pass on that heritage to these European people that were Christianized and pass on not only the biblical message and the gospel message, as a sort of narrow evangelism, but pass on also the richness of other cultures that have contributed to our society. And so we learned Greek and we learned Latin in our Christian schools and we studied the books of Plato and Cicero and it was Christians who promoted that kind of knowledge and they built on that and that is how European education has developed. And then later on when you had the humanist movement of Erasmus, the Enlightenment movement. It was out of Christianity that these movements arose. Without Christianity, they would, they would never have been possible. And the same can be said of modern science, secular ideologies and worldviews. They are deeply rooted in that what Christianity has contributed and passed on. Without that, it would never have happened. So Christianity was, a, was at the crossroads of all it. It was the transmitter of earlier knowledge and it added this unique worldview of the creator God and man in the image of God and that is given basis to what nowadays uh, are considered to be the common values that have emerged in our history but most of these values are deeply rooted in the Christian message and in the Christian church. Now if you read the treaties of Europe if you read the declarations of the European uh, uh, leaders, if you read texts of, uh, of the institutions in Brussels, they usually refer to this list. It's a short list and um, sociologists, when they talk about the European cultural world, they usually mention these kind of things. Now, if you just go over it, there's nothing very, uh, very uh, surprising about it. It is so obvious for all of us because we are Europe and this makes us European that we, that we say, yes, yes, it, this is a good list. We want that. That's what we want in our land. This is what we, what we want to stand for. But we do not realize that for ages there has been a, a battle, a struggle going on for each of these values. And very often the Christian church who gave birth to these ideas opposed these ideas. That was the paradoxical thing. So Christians had to fight other Christians to get a recognition of human rights, the individual human dignity, the care for the ill, the weak and the poor. That was not evident. If you look at old uh, civilizations and the excavations in archaeological sites, you will see a lot of things that are familiar. You will see military barracks, 
palaces, fortresses, and all kinds of things. But you will never see a hospital. Hospitals arose in the process of the Christianization of Europe. Marriage, monogamy, family, education, all these kind of things seem so obvious, but they have been, been, been reaped as the fruits of the fruits of the fruits of the spirit, as Francis Schaeffer said. Representative democracy started in the monasteries, and the idea of democracy is not that the majority rules all. The idea of democracy is that the majority takes in account the considerations of the minority. That's why we have representative minorities, my, the democracy, because the minorities do have their say in all these matters. That is the idea of, of democracy. Today, people have other ideas about it, but that's how it was. Now, the crucial question for today, of course, is do immigrants also belong to this Europe? Are they in it? Do they belong? Do Muslims belong? Are they in it? That's a very crucial question. And how can we help newcomers in Europe to have a place in Europe, as Europeans have always done? There's not any country in Europe that is not consisting of a lot of newcomers in the past that have become good British and good French and good German people. But if you go back three centuries ago, they were not there. We have always had to deal with that. And so that is the great question for today. Now, that is an ideal, the House of Nature political structure. I've talked about that. Um, and I make my second part with a just interruption. The political structure, that is another way of talking about Europe. We've had the periods of idealism in the 1950s. There was idealism in the 1990s when the Berlin Wall, well, the Berlin Wall did not fall, contrary to what we say, it never fell. Walls don't fall. It was broken down by people who didn't want it anymore. And we should say the destruction of the wall. So when the, the wall was destroyed, there was this idealistic period. Now we can unite all the Europeans in this one structure. Today we have more setbacks. Um, we will have a lecture by Paul Donders, I think on Tuesday morning, and he will deal with all the setbacks. So that will be a very positive and optimistic lecture, I hope. <laughs> because this list is already giving you a headache if you look at them. It already gives you a headache. Yeah. The, the attempts to develop an overarching European identity were not successful. People still place their region before Europe. We have the populist movement who see the European Union as part of the elite. We have the fear of immigration. The distinction between the secular West and the religious East is becoming more and more apparent. And we have the demographic turn. We are a dwindling, declining population. More Europeans die than there are born. That is unique in the history of mankind. Post-Europe dealt with it. Now, I would say, what is our place in all of this? What is our role? And I would like to remind you of this building, which you might know from pictures at any rate, uh, the Parliament Building of Europe. And it is deliberately uh, designed after the medieval representations of the Tower of Babel. The architect deliberately did that because of its unfinished nature. Now, apparently, the building contractors did not apply all the rules and the building is in such a bad shape that there is a discussion now should we just break it down and it's, that's again the history of the bible repeats itself but what very few people notice is this this sculpture in front of it and it's called europe a coeur take heart for europe and even if the building goes down the drain i don't care but this this sculpture i think is telling and it, it, it shows compassion, it shows community, it shows dialogue, it shows care, it shows all the things that we dream of when we want Europe to be ideally what it is. It is the Europe of the heart. And this is the message that has been so, been announced 
This is the seed that has been sown. This is the water that has irrigated our soils for 2,000 years. It is symbolized in this, in this picture, in this, in this sculpture. And if the, this, the building is destroyed, I hope they will leave this sculpture because it is, it is really telling everything that I, as a Christian, would want to stand for and want to see Europe embrace. Now, Christians in Europe, we represent, it, we represent the major source of the cultures and social institutions of Europe. Did you notice where we are? We are in, in a place that was called the Slotenmaker de Bruyne Institute. Now, even Dutch people have a lot of problems with that. But this place is Christian heritage. There's not a lot that reminds you of it, and that's typical of Europe. It has a new name, and one of the side buildings still is called the Slotenmaker de Bruyne Institute, but it's just a little bit. And if you're not noticing it, you will hear nothing. I've seen the leaflets, nothing, nothing of the heritage. But this place has been bought, the castle and the building next, by a foundation called the Slotenmaker de Bruyne Foundation. Slotenmaker de Bruyne was one of the leading Dutch politicians and theologians. He was the like of an Abraham Kuyper, but then in the Reformed Church. He was a church uh, canonist, but also a writer on the Christian social principles. And he was a major leader of the Christian trade union movement. And he took care of organizing Christians in order to combat social problems and poverty. And he became a cabinet minister. And as a cabinet minister, he was uh, responsible for social affairs and he was instrumental in getting laws passed that protected children, that protected people from who had accidents, from not having their wages, etc. All these social laws that now are evident. He was one of the architects of it. And so when after the Second World War, the, the Catholics and the Protestants decided to unite their trade union movement in the Christian National Trade Union Alliance, to which Lane is very much indebted because you have integrated the artists as well in the CNV, um, it was decided that, uh, that this place would be a place of education, of equipping, of training trade unions, Christian trade unions, and to do the job of social politics. Now, here we are in the Slotenmaker de Bruyne Institute, and you will go everywhere, and it is not very difficult to tell a story of some Christian who has done something for the glory of God and the well-being of his fellow being. You don't have to travel wherever you are in Europe. You can tell that story. There are interests. Now, the paradox is that we are so marked by the impact of Christianity, but also by the abandonment and the rejection of it. And this place is, again, typical of that. And in my workshop, I want to relate that paradox to communication bridges to barriers in our communication. Artists are communicators. They want to tell something. They want to pass on something. Now, this paradox is very important to understand why we are up with certain barriers and what are the typical bridges for communication and art. So that's the workshop. Christian artists in Europe, last part. Now, the word artist, again, it is a history. You might not be aware of it, but it's a biblical word. You will find it in Ephesians, Ephesians 4, where, it is talk, where Paul is talking about the people that God has given to the church to equip the saints for the service of God. And the word equipping is artistesein. It's the Greek word for artist. So we should make artists of Christians. Artistes and refer to the art of living. The wisdom you need to lead a good life. The art of being Christian or human, as the Greeks would say it. So art was for everybody. And now it is apparently only for the eccentric odd guy who can call himself an artist. But we've gone a long way from that. 
And as Christians involved in art, we should go back to the sources and not let us put on ourselves this idea that has emerged that we should be eccentric in order to qualify for an artist. That you should be everything except normal. And perhaps that our communication problem with the churches is that we have become perhaps a bit too eccentric because we wanted to be an artist. That's for you to work out that. As Christian artists, we are dwarfs, standing on the shoulders of giants. Do you know who said that? Bernard de Clairvaux, one of the great medieval leaders in Europe. And he talked about our generation, every generation is a dwarf, standing on the shoulders of enormous generations who are giants. And we just add a little bit to it. We are dwarfs. Let me show you. My friend um, Jeff Fountain made me aware of this, that when we write music, we stand as dwarfs on the shoulders of the giants who developed Gregorian chant. Now, that took ages. Gregorian chant took four or five ages to develop. It was a giant step forward. And it's the basis of all music. All music comes from Gregorian chant, theoretically. And even if you have funk or whatever, uh, what we call uh, rock music or soul, or whatever, theoretically, it, everything comes from Gregorian chant. And then the Gregorian chant, at a certain time, was passed on orally as the Greeks did it. They had theories, but it was all in. Then this Diarezzo came with this luminous idea of writing the, the scales, you had five scales, on a system of four lines. And that's the beginning of our uh, musical notation. And then the beginning note of every scale, you had six, six scales, had to be defined, and that became Do, Re, Mi. Beginning it was Ut, but then it became Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Si. Sancti Johann. Now that was a song, a Gregorian song. You might want to rehearse it tonight. It's a very beautiful song. And if you are musicians here to want to make an improvisation on it, a jazz improvisation, it would be very, uh, very good to do that. And it's a, a song to pray the help of Saint John to purify our lips so that we will not be cursed as the father of John, who was too quick to speak and who did not believe God. And so this is a prayer for us to purify our lips so that we might speak of the glory of God and not say bad things about what God has intended. And the beginning lines are do, re, mi, fa, so. Now, this is just an, just an, an example. Here are seven suggestions, very quickly, for Christian artists. Our first task is to transmit and develop Christian artistic heritage. We are the dwarfs on the shoulders of our giants. And in so doing, and this is not only for classical musicians, by the way, link Europe with its own sources and its own history. We are in a unique position. Many Europeans have, have abandoned religion, but they cherish culture not knowing that the culture is full of religion. And that is for us to explain. We can explain to the illiterate, the secular and other religions, who do not know anything about that. We are in this position. We are the communicators of this enormous, rich heritage. And we can develop it further. European is not something static. This is our first challenge. The second one is to regain a biblical understanding of art and the role of artists, and not let us be uh, determined by the, the, the folly of the day. And here are some key notions that have always been there in the history of European art, which is, for a large part, the history of Christian European art. The, the idea of Gloria Dei, man, is called to reflect the image of God, which is not only a moral image, but also an aesthetic image. 
we can reflect the glory of God. The artist is an artisan, and his role was, de 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 was described as a serving role. The artist is a servant. That was the key notion in the medieval world, and that's why churches paid their servants. An artist was a minister, like the minister of the word, and they were paid for that because we needed these servants. Their name was not important, but they served. They served the church and society. So our servant status is very important. The artists had the calling to build community. This is a key notion in the Catholic tradition, in the Orthodox tradition. The artist is there to build community, to bring people together. Why do we write hymns? Because we build community. Why do we make music? Because we have people coming together without talking. They share an experience. We build community. And so humility is the mark of the true artist. In the academic world, you have the gown. And then you have the stola, the, the hood, as it is called in English, which is given to you when you become a PhD. But most PhD people do not realize that it is a sign of humility because now that you have reached your dissertation and your PhD, now we give you the hood and now you have become so humble that you only know a very little bit. You've passed 20 years of your life to discover that you only know a very little bit and that's why we give you the hood and that's why you become a servant now. And this has always been characteristic of artists as well. The artist does not bring himself but he serves God, the church, and society. That's the biblical understanding. We have the, the unique uh, capacity that by our creative gifts, we can express biblical moral values and a worldview that have shaped our world. If you make a film, what are the moral values that come out of it? What do the people retain when they've seen it? When you write a book, are we in the way of deconstructing as it is so popular? We just deconstruct and we just, well, there's nothing left. Or are we constructing something? Can we tell biblical moral values in a unique way, in a creative way, that builds society? What is our vision of God, our vision of man? What do we tell? There is so much ugliness, the, the theater, um, well, this is, a, is an example of it. Uh, I'm living next to Avignon, and the festival of Avignon is a very famous thing. But every year it gets worse. Um, on the main stage, the themes are so destructive that you just, you just get nausea bond of it. This year it is uh, violence and blood. Now, for two weeks, in the old palace of the popes, plays are put on stage where it is violence and blood and bloodshed all over. That's the theme. Now, what, what, what can we do to, to not become very predictive? But what is our alternative? We can create bridges of communication for the message. It is my experience that culture, art, is a magnificent way of opening the ground for real questions opening the ground of real questions. New Age music has already discovered that. And people flock to the sessions. And art is opening ground. So we have this possibility of creating bridges for communication. Christian artists have always communicated the message. We should not be afraid of that. We've always done it. When Do Re Mi was invented, it was a Christian hymn. It was a prayer. We've always done that. And our rich heritage is full of it. Our museums are full of it. We've always done that in a very creative way. And the giants on whose shoulders we stand have showed us the way to not be too modest about it, but to use every mean to create a bridge of communication for the gospel. Art is also an enormous uh, potential for bridging gaps between people, bringing, bringing people groups together. I had great fun in doing some concerts uh, a few years ago 
organized by a lady in our church who was a mayor of a very small village. And she had a budget that she didn't use for years and it accumulated and accumulated. And it was a budget to, to put culture at the disposal of people who do not have the means to go to a concert. Art is becoming a very elitist thing. You have to be rich and well-to-do to appreciate it. And many people never go to a concert, never go to a museum, never do anything like that, and they're not exposed to it because they don't have the means. And so this was a budget to do that for free. Now, they paid me all right, but the people did not pay for it. And um, I was so impressed by the reactions that I played, um, I played Chopin, I played Chopin, it was in the, the, the year of his death, it's the commemoration of his death, and I explained a bit of the, his personal pilgrimage. And the people were moved to tears, not by, by me playing, but the simple fact that they were just sitting there looking at someone playing Chopin, for them that was another world. And so we, through art, we can, we can comfort people, we can, we can mean something for people, we can bring people and classes together. And in our struggle to get our just salary, we should not forget that for a large part of the population, culture is too expensive. And what do we do for these people? Connect the art with the strangers of the people. Yes, I have to stop, but this is a, a, the, it's the, it's the first, it's the penultimate point. There are strangers in Europe coming. Can they become part of our European artistic history? Now here again is a tremendous challenge. How can we include people from other parts of the world to settle here? How can they appreciate our art tradition? And how can we use their artistic heritage to include it? And I think popular music is a very good example of including the stranger and his art in our artistic experience. And artist, artists have the, have the privilege of paving the way for others in society. And the last one, beauty. Now, the old uh, triad is that the church, um, the Christian church, is called to announce and to transmit goodness, truth, that's the rational, the, the moral, and beauty. Truth, goodness, and beauty. Now let me just dwell on beauty and make that into another triad. We are in the business of beauty. That's art. And beauty can be a source of contemplation, comfort, and hope. There are so many people out of touch with God, but looking for something spiritual. Beauty can be a way of contemplating, of opening our hearts and minds for the presence of God. That's a unique privilege we have for the Europeans who got lost, who get lost spiritually in this world. There are so many people who are despairing. There are people suffering. Beauty can be a source of comfort. There is music therapy, we, we all know that, but we often forget that we are evangelists and pastors, servants, and we can comfort people. There is such a comfort in beauty. And if you have the gift to create objects or works of beauty, writing texts that for the beauty of it are worth reading three times over, you have this unique calling to comfort people. And then in the despair, beauty is a sign of the beyond. This world is not the last world. Beauty reminds us of the world to come. Thank you. Evert, thank you. We give you a nice present. It's a piece of art, so you will not forget us. Um, no, no. <laughs> and um, later on uh, um, at CA, he will give a workshop. So it might have um, stimulated you in some questions, but then I better refer to the workshop as we really have to move on to the last part of um, this afternoon. That is uh, Judith. 
En er was one announcement. Let me read it. Um, the ones who participate in uh, the exposition, uh, so work at the panels and, and the tables, please bring you artwork to that location just here outside before dinner today. So um, they're going to, to hang that and work with that. So if you have a piece of art you want to show, then before dinner, put it there and uh, they will work with that. Judith, it's up to you. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Judith, as Lena said, I come to Christian Artists every year as a pastor, I've been coming for many, many years, I live in Edinburgh in Scotland and I just want to be the person who says there are an awful lot of us in Britain who do not want Brexit, so just so you know that there are... So you know there are many of us who cry on our pillows almost every night on the news of it, and if you want to pray, pray we have another referendum, because I know that the result would be different. Anyway, I haven't come to talk about Brexit or, or even Scotland. I've come to talk about communities of practice. I'm here to encourage you because as a pastor, I'm a part of the leadership team of my church at home, as a pastor I believe very passionately about community. I believe that it's only when we join together that we really can find the strength that Jesus can have for us. And that's because God is our gardener. Jesus is the vine and you and I are the branches. And I just thought very quickly, if you could all hold hands with somebody just to feel like what it might feel like to be part of a vine. So can you just hold hands quickly across the rows? Because we're going to be put into groups in a minute but I also want you to get that feeling that there's somebody on the other side of the room who you might not ever talk to, but you still are connected to them. <laughs> okay, thank you. Everett's been talking about community. Christianity is about community. And what I want, we want to do for you now is to put you into communities of practice. That means that you join together with other people who are in the same discipline as you. And hopefully we have some leaders here who are ready to jump up onto the stage when I uh, call you to, to come up. Um, but just to encourage you, while you're here at Christian Artists, to be there to connect with, to be here to connect with people. Come and give yourself to people in friendship. Be prepared to be a mentor to others, but also be prepared to listen to others. Prepared to, be prepared to learn from one another because what we want is by the end of this week, you will go away having been changed by being part of the people you are amongst. Right, we haven't got much time, so I'm going to move straight on. These are communities of practice. So I'm going to read out the different communities and I'm going to call up onto the stage the leader for each of these communities. So first, Instrumentalist by Jonathan Rompay. Is Jonathan here? Yes, come up, Jonathan. Now, what we're going to do is that each of your leaders is going to hold up a sign to show what group they are leading and at the end when we've got all the leaders up here I want you to make up your mind who you feel you want to be connected to and then that leader will go off into a part of the building either in here or somewhere else uh, further afield and will um, get you can get together exchange names talk about your hopes and dreams for this week pass on information and particularly uh, information most of all I think your uh, email address. Okay, so. Okay. Of course. Okay. So we're going to go. You're going to go out, leader. You'd have to take everybody really out because we're going to be working in this room. Okay. Uh, the second one is vocalists and singers, but not singer-songwriters, led by Dee Dee. <laughs> And the third one is the um, 
uh, singer-songwriters by Klaus Andre. It's Klaus here, thank you. Uh, the next one is 2D art painting by Peter Smith. Peter, I've seen Peter, yes. <laughs> and the next one is um, art and sculpture, 3D art by, oh dear, and I can't pronounce, Marit, Marit. M Micah Bolt. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and the next one is photography film by Paul. Paul Yates. Is Paul here? Yes, Paul's there. Yes. The next one is dance by Damaris. Um, art, acting, clowning, and mime by Arthur. Um, writing poetry and prose by me, and I must have it somewhere in <laughs> somewhere on. And art therapy by y Yoshiko. <laughs> So, have a look at all these and see, try to get a feel of where you feel you belong, and I'm just going to hold mine up in a second, where you feel you belong, and then when we come to the end in this session, oh yes it is, did I give you the wrong one? Oh, that's me, <laughs> okay, um, just have a feel about where, which group you'd like to be part of. The idea is that, that during this week, you, if you are a newcomer to Christian Artists this year, or even if you've been a few years on the run, you will begin to get to know other people, make connections, feel you belong, feel you're part of a family, feel that this is a place where you can feel secure, a place where you can grow, a place where you can feel able to let yourself be uh, helped. And that's what it's all about, really. Some of us have been coming here for 30, bleh, how many years? And it's all about being helped and feeling that you belong here. Um, just before uh, I ask you all to disperse, uh, just to say that the chapel service is in the Orangery tomorrow morning at 7.30 and you all would be very welcome. If you can't manage that time in the morning and you still would like somebody to pray with you, I'd be very happy to pray with you during the week. So just go to reception or come and talk to me at some point during the week. Right, I think that's it. Can you think of anything else? No? Right, everybody, um, I think you better start. Anybody who would like to go with Clown and uh, Mime and follow Arthur? Follow yes. And dance, yes, dance with um, Dam Damaris. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jonathan. <laughs> just hold, hold your signs up. If the leaders hold the signs up, just can you gravitate towards them? Oh, great. 